Let us pray. Father, we thank you very much for gathering us together once again today. Thank you because the word of God, the scriptures, the Holy Bible, is a charge you've given us to lead us to heaven. And we pray, O oh Lord, that every time we come before you to study this word, you grant us the seriousness that we need so that we'll take all your word in, in Jesus' name. Grant us understanding. Grant us illumination. Open our hearts to understand your word. And we pray, Lord, that the decision to follow through and to be obedient to your word, you give unto us in Jesus' name. Strengthen our spiritual lives as we study the word. Make us men, not children. Let's know, Lord, we're not to toy with your word, but to take your word seriously. Because this is a map you have given us that points us the way to get to heaven. Open our eyes of understanding again today. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study. For the benefit of those who are coming for the first time, and those who have been coming before, I need to refresh your memory. And I need to tell you how important the study of the Word of God is. And that's what I've told you. The Word of God. Many people are speaking around you. The words of men. But the words of men will not do anything permanent or eternal for you. It is this word of God that is eternally beneficial. And that's why we come together every week. Just to open the pages of the scriptures. And to study in obedience to the word of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 34. I'm reading to you from verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. It tells you, take out the Bible, take out the word of God, dust it off. Don't allow spiders to put their webs around the word. Bring out that word, read it. Then it tells you in assurance that no one of these shall fail and none shall want a mate. Because it says, for my mouth it has commanded. And he also says, a spirit, it has gathered them. It tells you the assurance, gives you the assurance that this word of God, it cannot fail. Every word, every judge, every teaching of it is so important. But then if the word is in the book and you don't bring it out, you don't read it, it will not have any benefit for you. And that's why whether we're members of the church or we're workers and leaders in the church, uh, there is one important thing for you to do. Get out the word of God. Get out the book of the Lord. Study it. You need it for yourself. You need it for the people you are ministering to. In Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. And to teach in Israel the statutes and the judgments. Here the Lord is telling us by the example and the life of Ezra. That no one has a right to stand and declare and teach the word of God. Without first of all preparing his own heart. Reading the word of God. Studying that word of God. And then being able to declare it unto the people that are waiting to hear. And as you come, leaders, workers, and members of the church, and invitees, as you come every week, understand, this word of God will do you good. And because of the good it will do in your life, that's why you need to prepare your heart. You see that? When you come in, you prepare your heart. You'll not be looking around. You'll be praying to the Lord, Lord, open my eyes, that I may see and behold. Touch my heart. Mold me and melt me. Let this word do something in me. Uh, you, and while the teaching of the word of God is going on, you're still preparing your heart and receiving everything the Lord has for you. And it is as to store up the word of God week after week, month after month, year after year. It is that word of God stored in your heart. When God brings you into the ministry, you'll be able to teach other people also, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, reading from verse 32. And now, brethren, I commit you, commend you unto God 
and to the watch of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It tells us it is this word of God that is able to build us up. If you come to the Lord is the word that tells you about repentance. As you repent, it's the word of the Lord that assures you when you believe you are saved. And then it's the word of God that tells you the life you are to live after you are born again. And then that tells you about sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy watch is truth. And it's as you move on and you hear the word of God, you see the need necessity of being baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. And it's as you move on, the word of God will tell you your duty, your responsibility, how you are to evangelize your community. And it's building you up, building you up, and building you up every time. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Now, brethren, and that's one thing I'm going to do as I want to part with you. I commend you, commit you to God and to the word of his grace. It's that word that is able to build you up. Study that word in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Reading verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, properly, adequately, intelligently, scripturally, dividing the word of truth. It is the reason why you'll find every sober-minded Christian, everyone that has actually started the way, the journey into heaven, and he seriously wanting to make it without anything hindering him, there is one central thing you'll find in the life of such an individual and it is the study of the word of god in fact and when you think about it what gets you close to the lord makes you a friend of god makes you come into fellowship with the lord and strengthens your spiritual life and makes god to look at you as a favorite is the attitude you have towards the watch of the lord in luke chapter 10. luke chapter 10 Reading verse 38, now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Of all the things you can do, is the most important and the most essential and the most uh, and the most beneficial and the most effectual and the most effective and the most favored and the most precious in the sight of almighty god is when you sit down without any distraction and without any wandering heart and you center your affection you center your attention you center your gaze everything you have within and without you center it on the word of the lord as Jesus got into this house, there was Martha. And Martha was very, very busy about wanting to serve the Lord. And that was a good thing. And that was a wonderful thing. Wanting to just minister to the Lord. But there was something in Mary. And that thing in Mary was just to sit down, heart opened, eyes opened, ears opened, all the attention given without any distraction at all without looking here and there without allowing the mind to wander just gazing into the eyes of jesus and just listening to the gracious words coming out of the mouth of christ and it says mary sat at jesus feet and heard his word but martha was worried occupied burdened Converge about much serving. It wouldn't you be surprised as we're coming here and we're hearing the word of God? Would you be surprised that there are people that think about many, many other things? Things here and things there and things over there and things yonder and things beyond. That although we're here for the Bible study, the mind, the heart, the spirit, the attention is not fully given to the watch of the Lord. It is something else they are thinking about. And Martha was combat and worried and burdened and occupied about much serving. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care 
that my sister has led me to serve alone, bid her therefore that she help me. Here is Jesus the word personified. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word came and dwelt among us. And the writer of the word. The inspirer of the word. The word personified. Came to their house. To open the pages of the word unto them. And Martha was so occupied about other things. But Mary knew this is my chance. When the word personified himself. When he comes to our house. And he gives me the word, the death of the world. This is my chance. I better listen. But Martha was of another mind. And came to Jesus and said, Why don't you tell this woman, Mary, to, to come up and help me? And Jesus answered and said, Unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled, worried and combat and burning about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I pray the study of the word will not be taken away from you in Jesus' name. What a wonderful privilege to come together as we are here today to study the word of the Lord. We are now in Joel. We have been studying the book of Joel, and it's a wonderful thing to study because the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration, and every scripture is good, profitable unto doctrine, and profitable for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the child of God, the man of God, the woman of God, you there, that you may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you ever have any hope of being perfected, it's by the study of the word of God, application of the word of God. That's why we study Old Testament, we study New Testament. At this time now, we're studying Joel. And we're now in Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, we're looking at verses 1 through to 11 today. And it's titled, The Alarming Approach of an Irresistible Army. The alarming approach of an irresistible army. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is near at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there has not been ever the like, neither shall any more be after it. Even to the years of many generations, a fire departeth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains. So shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoured the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one trust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the, in the city. And they shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a sea. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. 
for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Those words I read to you, they are the words that God gave to Joel. And as he told the Joel the prophet, he was telling them of the warning of an impending doom, an impending judgment, the wrath of God coming upon the people of Judah. I told you before that Joel was telling them, the day of man is soon coming to an end. The day of man is man's day of rebellion. But then he said, at the end of the day of man, there will be the day of God, and that's God's day of retribution. Day of man, rebellion. Day of God, retribution. And then the prophecy he gave them had an application to them, the people of Judah. It also has an application, not only to the people of Judah, but to the whole world. That's why uh, the students of the Bible... And even if you are not a deep student of the Bible, as you read all the verses in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you will see that there is a near fulfillment. And then there is a future fulfillment. And there is an immediate fulfillment. And then there is an eschatological fulfillment. For the people of Judah, the immediate near fulfillment is a disaster. And devastation and destruction was coming upon them. And it came just about a hundred years after the prophecy. But then the rest of it, when the sun will be darkened, and the moon will withdraw its light, and the stars will withdraw their shining, that is still in the future. After the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon turn into blood, and the stars will not shine, and they will fall. And then will be the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. And so you know that uh, there is an immediate fulfillment as well as a future fulfillment. But then uh, when he told them, he said, the Lord said, blow ye the trumpet. And that has significance in the land of Judah. And now uh, we divide the study into three parts. Verses 1 to 3, the announcement of a coming judgment. And verses 4 to 9, the agents of a consuming judgment. And then verses 10 and 11, the accomplishments of a conquering judge. We look at verses 1 to 3 once again. And here we now look at the announcement of a coming judgment. He was making the announcement to them. And he was telling them, something is coming, something is coming, get prepared. And the Lord is telling us the same thing today as we look at the book of Joel. Something is coming. It's never come before. There is no parallel. There is no equal to the devastation, the destruction, and the judgment that is soon coming at the end of the age, at the end of the world. Get prepared. And so in verses 1 to 3, blow ye the trumpet in Zion. You need to understand that. You see many of us, uh, because we do not have the background of the children of Israel. We do not understand some simple statements that are made. And any time that uh, the children of Israel had that, blow ye the trumpet. Uh, they knew what it meant because in Israel it meant, number one, inviting people to religious worship. Whenever they blow the trumpet, it may be for the reason, number one, inviting them to religious worship. In Numbers chapter 10, Numbers chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly, and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, with those trumpets, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Jump on to verse 10. Also, in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your bunch offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So number one. When they blew the trumpet, it will be that they were calling them, assembling them. Come, come and let us worship. 
And when those people, when they heard the blowing of the trumpet, it, didn't eat, it could be for one of three things. The, one, the first thing, just that, will come to worship the Lord in Psalm 81. Psalm 81, verse 3. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. So you understand? It may be for worship. Number two. It may be that they wanted to summon them to a battle. Warfare against the enemy. And if it wasn't for worship and they had the blowing of the trumpet, they knew that that's a war. A warfare. A battle. And the trumpet is calling them. Buckle up. Put on your belt. Put on all your armor. And fight in the battle. Numbers chapter 10 again. In Numbers chapter 10, verse 9. Numbers 10, verse 9. And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. And ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God. And ye shall be saved from your enemies. So you understand? The second reason why they blew the trumpet is that they were calling them for battle. They were calling them for war. But then there was a third reason. Whenever they blew the trumpet in the land of Israel, that third reason was to warn them of impending danger. And when they sounded that alarm with the sound of the trumpet, the children of Israel knew if it wasn't for worship, if it wasn't a call for battle, for warfare, then it will be for number three, it will be that they were being warned of impending doom, impending danger, and they were to prepare themselves in Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Reading from verse 3. If when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever hear the sound of the trumpet... And taketh not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet. He took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his own iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And so the children of, of Israel knew, they understood. When a trumpet was blown, it meant that maybe they were being warned. It was a sound of alarm to alert them, awaken them, warn them of the awful judgment that was coming from the hand of the almighty God. And sometimes they didn't even blow the trumpet. But uh, they raised their voices. And they made the voice sound clear and loud like a trumpet. And they knew because those children of Israel, they knew. That's the sound of alarm. It is to warn us of an impending doom and danger. In Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading to you from verse 1. Cry aloud. Spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. That's it. Even when they did not blow the trumpet, lift up the voice, cry aloud, shout. And when you do that, spare not. As you lift up your voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression and the house of Israel their sins. And these were religious people, not to religious people, yet they seek me daily. And delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness. And forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching unto God. Uh, so when their leaders, when their prophets, when their preachers, when their priests. Lifted up the voice warning them. They knew it was of the Lord. And you know that this sound of warning did not end with the Old Testament. It continued in the New Testament and lifting up the voice like a trumpet, shouting it out, crying it aloud, that warning will come to the people of God. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, 
And there in verse 31, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. He was lifting up his voice like that of a trumpet. And he was uh, warning the people. And it's not only the preacher that even warns. In fact, the responsibility of lifting up your voice and warning all the people around you, that responsibility is given to every believer. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, all the members of the church now, warn them that are unruly. Warn them that unruly uh, sound your own trumpet to you, lift up your voice to you like a trumpet. In fact, uh, the word of God tells us that without the lifting up of the voice, without the warning, uh, the church will not be perfected. In Colossians chapter 1, at the end of verse 27, it says, Christ in you is a hope of glory. And then it says in verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in christ jesus if we don't warn the church if we don't warn one another if everything is sweet sweet talk loving talk palatable talk acceptable talk inviting talk positive talk we will not be perfected there is a part of the ministry the ministry of the leader, the ministry of the preacher that raises the voice and cries aloud, lifts up the voice like that of a trumpet to warn the people of God. It is that warning, preaching, warning, teaching every man that we may present every man perfect, perfect at last in Christ. Come back to Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 1 again, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. You understand now. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is near at hand. Here Joel said, there's an alarm. And this alarm is being sounded. So that the people that hear, they will take warning. Because that day is coming. It will definitely come. In Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah. Reading from chapter 4, verses 5, all through to 7. Jeremiah 4, 5. Declare ye in Judah, publish in Jerusalem, say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, let us go into the defensive cities. Set up the standard towards Zion, retire, stay not. For I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. A lion is come up from his ticket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He is gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. And you see the thing that was coming on them. And because that thing was coming on them, and there was something they needed to do. Sound the alarm. Warn the people. So that they will not say they didn't hear. Maybe if they heard the sound of that alarm, then they will call upon the Lord. And they will fall upon their faces in genuine repentance. Acceptable repentance. In Isaiah chapter 8. Reading there in verse 22. Isaiah 8 verse 22. And they shall look unto the earth. Behold trouble and darkness. Dimness of anguish. And they shall be driven to darkness. And that's the thing that was coming. That's why uh, this uh, uh, prophet was telling them. It's time to warn everyone. Because of the days of gloominess. And the days of darkness. And the days of wrath. And divine indignation coming upon the people. Because he's sending his army upon his beloved land. In Psalm, Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. Our God shall come. And shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him. And it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that 
he may judge, he may punish his people. And that's the reason the people of God are to set the trumpet in their mouth and they are to blow their lamb so that the people will take warning. Maybe if they will repent before that devastation will come, before the destruction will come, then there will be mercy coming to them from the face and from the side of the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7, reading from verse 11. But they refused to hack him. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears. That they should not hear. Yea. They made their hands as an adamant stone. Lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by his former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath. From the Lord of hosts. This will not be the first time. You remember the time of Noah. When he cried. When he shouted. A preacher of righteousness. 120 years. He was telling the people. He was blowing the trumpet. He was giving them warning. Because he himself. When he received that warning from the Lord. In faith and fear. He obeyed the Lord. And he built the ark. But all those people. They anti the Luvian age they did not respond they went on in their sin in their iniquity in their evil and then eventually the flood came upon them and carried them all away and jesus said as it was in the days of noah so shall it be at the time when the son of man shall come they'll be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until that day will come it will come upon them unawares and one shall be taken and the other shall be left so it means that the same carelessness the same dullness of hearing and the same deafness in the ear spiritually that we see with the children of israel is still going to persist until the final day in verse 13 it says therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they will not hear so they cried and i will not hear says the lord of hosts but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned. For they laid the pleasant land desolate. That's what came on them. Come back to Joel chapter 2. And see what the prophet was telling them. As I told them, blow the trumpet. And he told them what was coming in verse 2. A day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds, and of sea darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people, a strong people. There has not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after, uh, after it. Even to the years of many generations. Because a fire devoured before them. And behind them a flame burned. And the land is as the garden of Eden before they, before they get there. Uh, the, the, the land is just green and fruitful and, and wonderful like the garden of Eden. When they pass through, devastation, desolation comes and behind them, a desolate wilderness. And yea, yes, it says yes and nothing shall escape. Why are we studying all that? We are studying all these because as it happened to the people of Judah. So it's going to happen on the final day. In the first, in first Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. They are in verse 7. It tells us, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The things of the world will soon come to an end. There's a fire that will descend. Burn up everything. And there's going to be a conflagration. There's going to be a desolation. There's going to be a burning. And the earth and all sin that therein we find is going to be burnt with fire. Seeing that these things shall be so, what manner of men, what manner of women, ought we to be in all holy conversation and paul the apostle said in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 11 knowing therefore the terror of the lord we persuade men i go to point number two joel needed to tell the people that yes the announcement of a coming judgment is there what are the agents that the lord will use in bringing this devastation and destruction and desolation upon the land of Judah. 
it tells us uh, the description in verses for all through to nine uh, this is awesome terrifying and this is terrible uh, look at them from verse four the appearance of them it says the appearance of horses and the horsemen so shall they run like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoured the stubble as a strong people set in battle array before their face the people shall be much pained all faces shall gather blackness they shall run like mighty men they shall climb the wall like men of war and then it says they shall march everyone on his way and they shall not break their ranks that is they'll be so trained there's an army and they'll be walking in ranks all filed up with their swords on their side and their ammunitions and weapons in their hands and it says neither shall one thrust another they will not just go against the other so trained so well trained they shall walk everyone in his path everyone will keep to his track and then it says and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded they are so armed and they put the armor on and all their bodies were covered that even when they fell on the sword it will not pierce them and it says they shall run to and fro in the city and judah will never have seen anything like that in their lives before it will just strike terror into their hearts they shall run upon the wall they shall climb upon the houses and it says they shall enter in at the windows like a thief you see that they pick them up one by one those verses i just read to you now as you look at verse 4 what do you see the appearance of the people the appearance of them is like the appearance of horses as you look at uh, verse 5 what do you see you see the ability like the noise of chariots on the top of the mountains so shall they leap and it, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array you have the appearance you have the ability as you look at the next verse uh, you see not only the appearance not only the ability the agony and the affliction they bring upon the people because it tells us in verse 6 before their face the people shall be much pain all faces shall gather blackness and then we see their activity in verse 7 they shall run like mighty men they shall climb the wall like men of war and they shall march everyone on his ways and then it says they shall not break their rank and then in the next verse in verse 8 their array or their arrangement see that in verse 8 neither shall one thrust another and they shall walk everyone in his path and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded and then we see the assault or the attack verse 9 they shall run to and fro in the city they shall run upon the wall they shall climb up upon the houses and they shall enter in in the windows like thieves the appearance the ability the agony and the affliction they inflict upon the people their activity their real their arrangement the assault and the attack now as you look at these verses and you see the other parts of the scripture telling us the same thing please read verse 4 again the appearance of them it says the appearance of horses and as the horsemen they shall run revelation chapter 9 see what revelation is saying exactly the same thing in revelation chapter 9 verse 7 and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as each were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men in verse 9 and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle come back to joel in joel chapter 2 reading there in verse 5 verse 5 says it's like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains that they shall leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array exactly what joel is saying is what isaiah a contemporary prophet also said at that time isaiah chapter 5 
Isaiah chapter 5 telling us by the mouth of two or three witnesses saying the same thing the truth shall be established Isaiah 5 24 and 25 therefore as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the charm so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and despise the watch of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he has stretched forth a sign against them, and he has smitten them, and the hills shall tremble, and their carcasses shall be shall turn, what turn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away because he didn't repent, but his hand is stretched out still. And you'll see what Joel had said. Isaiah 2 was emphasizing unto the people that a judgment was coming. And then you, you look at Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, look at verse 6. It says, Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather darkness. And that is when this army, the Babylonian army, the Assyrian army, will come upon them, nobody will have any strength anymore. And their faces will just gather paleness. It will lose it, its vigor, its vitality. And it will be so depressed because they will know that there is nothing they could do. It was just like they were going to be destroyed. Everybody just trembled before the army that came. Isaiah is still saying the same thing. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13. Then in verse 7. It says, Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as women that travaileth labor pains. They shall be amazed, surprised, astonished one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And you see that the Lord is after the sinners, after the rebellious, after the disobedient, after the people that have not been obedient to the watch of the Lord. Jeremiah, Jeremiah says the same thing. In Jeremiah chapter 9, Jeremiah chapter 9, it is Bible study. Open your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 19. Here it says, for a voice of wailing, screaming, crying, crying for pain, is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded because we are forsaking the land, because our dwelling have cast us out. In verse 21, for death has come up into our windows and is entered into our palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. Come back to Joel. As Joel was describing all these things to them, in fact, it's very good for us to know that what Joel said, other prophets said as well. And I told you that the prophecy of Joel was not limited to Judah. That at the end of time, at the end of the age, it will be for the whole world. Now I read from Joel chapter 2, reading there from verse 7. They shall run like mighty men. That's the army against the people of God, against Judah. They shall climb the wall like men of war. Time of war, time of battle, time of God's judgment upon the people. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. How will Judah be able to deal with such an army? That sword will not affect them. Spears will not affect them. If they even fall down on the sharp edge of the sword, they get up again and they continue to fight. Then Judah knew from the description we're seeing about the enemy that there was no way of escape for them. And then it says they never get tired. They shall run to and fro in the city. And they shall run upon the walls 
and they shall climb up upon the houses and they shall enter in they don't even wait for you to open the door they enter through the windows like a sea now this has been describing uh, the the people uh, that were going to wage war against the people of judah but i told you that it also has a future fulfillment look at isaiah chapter 5 isaiah chapter 5 verse 26 and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth and behold they shall come with speed swiftly none shall be weary nor stumble among them none shall slumber nor sleep neither shall they gaggle of their loins be loosed is describing the strength of the army the power of the army the ability of this army now the lashes of their shoes be broken whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent and their horses hooves shall be counted like flint and their wheels like the one wind and their running shall be like a lion they shall roar like the young lion yes yea they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and they shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it and then it says in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea and if one look unto the land behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof and so you you find that uh, Joel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the others, Old Testament, New Testament, they speak of these things. And the devastation that is still coming at the end of time is, is so terrible. It's beyond description. That's why those who are children of God, they need to prepare themselves so that you will not partake of the sin that will be on that day. But uh, let's think about this. As we think about the enemies... As we think about these army, armies that will come against them, you see three things. Their speech. You see their steadfastness. You see their system. They walked speedily and they ran to and fro. They walked systematically that nothing escaped them. And then they remained steadfast until nothing remained. Now, if the messengers of wrath, the messengers of destruction, the messengers of judgment, if they were so systematic, if they were so steadfast, and it was so speedy, how much more the people of God, we messengers of divine mercy, we messengers of the salvation of the Lord, how we too, number one, we should manifest steadfastness like them, and a good system arrangement like them, and a good speed in executing the will of the Lord, as they were strong, we should be strong in the grace and the strength of the Lord. As they were swift, we should be swift in the work of the Lord he has given us to do. Now, we come to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the accomplishments of a conquering judge. Actually, everything here was done by the Lord. It's the one that brought the northern army to come upon them. And uh, we look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, before their, face, before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather darkness. And then jump to verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. And the sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. In verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For his strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Here is the question, who can abide it? And you see those verses, number one, the dreadful consequence on Judah. The dreadful consequence on Judah. Before their face of people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. Number two, the distressing calamities on the Jews. That's in verse 10. The earth shall quake. It goes beyond the Jews now. It's starting with the Jews, starting with Judah. 
And then, because he's reaching out to the end of time, even the old earth shall quake before them, and the heavens shall tremble, and the sun and the moon shall be dark. So that he gets into the time of the great tribulation. And then, number three, the distant consummation and climax of judgment. It mentions the whole earth, and then the sun and the moon, all darkened, and the stars were drawing their shining. And then it says, The Lord that is suttering his voice before his army, and his camp is very great. That is, the people he gathers together to bring the devastation and the judgment and the destruction. They are very great, for he is strong. Talking about the Lord that executes his word is the day of the Lord, is great and terrible, and who can abide it? But I told you that this already looking into the future. And it's talking about the great tribulation in Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. Ask ye now, and see whether a man does travel with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands to his loins as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness, alas. For that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it, a remnant of them. A part of them shall be rescued. Nahum spoke about that same day. The day that was coming, the day of judgment, the day of devastation coming upon the people. My prayer for you and for myself is that we will not experience that day with the people of the world in Jesus' name. In Nahum chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, Nahum, verse 10. She is empty, void, waste. The heart melted. The knees might together. And much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. That's how terrible it will be on that day, that nobody will be able to withstand or stand it. And then we're told in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 14. Zechariah chapter 1, Zephaniah rather, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. And hastes greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry. There bitterly. That is the strong people. Even the people that never cried before. The day will be so terrible. The mighty man shall cry. There bitterly. That day is a day of pros. A day of trouble. And distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet. A day of alarm against the fenced cities. Against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon the men. And they shall walk like blind men. Because they have sinned against the Lord. And they receive all this is because of unrepented sin. Continued sin. Habitual sin. That the warning came from the prophets of God and from the proclaimers of the mercy of God. And the people will not turn and they will not repent. And they were adamant in evil. It says because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as doors. And their flesh as the dung. Neither shall their silver nor their gold, their riches, their wealth. They shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy readance of all them that dwell in the land. And you can see from the description that great terrible things are coming upon the people of this world. And the time of the great tribulation, it will happen any time from now. Because you know that uh, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, they, were, uh, they knew the time will come. They knew the day of the Lord will come. And they knew the devastation, destruction, desolation that the Old Testament prophets spoke about. They knew it will come because heaven and earth may pass away. Not a jot or a tittle shall pass away out of the word of God until everything be fulfilled. That's why they were asking, when shall these things be? 
And then the Lord began to tell them that they should take it, no man should deceive them. Because many will say, I'm Christ. And there will be wars and rumors of wars. And then it says, there will be farming in many places. Pestilences and earthquakes. And if you are reading your newspapers, if you are listening to the news, you know that all these things are there. How many people are just dying away because of farming? Nothing to eat. And the pestilences. Have you not heard about the AIDS devastating, wiping out populations? And have you not heard about the earthquakes? Just uh, this year, uh, the one that took place in India, thousands and thousands of people. Can you read all these and not match them with the word of God and know that the time is coming, it's at the door. And then he even tells us, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. If you are not reading newspapers, if you are not listening to the radio, at least you see many people around you that were far benched before. Many people that were hot and consecrated for the Lord before, but now their love has waxed cold. He used to be one isolated person here, one isolated person there. Now you cannot even measure it or number it anymore. In many, many places that the love of many works in cold. And then it shows you that the day is coming. The day is coming. It's a time. And you know the Lord warned the people at the time of Noah. And he's still warning us today. It says of that day of that hour, Noah is no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. And you know people, if they just read just one verse of the Bible, a verse, a verse or two of the Bible, they will know. Certain day, uh, there is nothing to eat. A group just rose up this new year and said that they said that Jesus is coming. They withdrew their children from school. Uh, they, they came away from all the work they were doing. They will not work. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. All they are to do now is to eat and, and then spend all the money they have received all these years. It must come this year. It's coming this year. Children, no schooling. Foolishness of that day and that hour. No, it's no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But I see, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. But then it tells us the devastation that will come, when the son of man approaches you are now in matthew chapter 24 verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall uh, shall shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven of the heavens shall be shaken and then uh, uh, joel is asking when that day shall come when the indignation of God, the wrath of God shall come, who shall be able to abide? It's the same thing that John is asking us in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, reading there in verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black. Still talking about the same thing. As sackcloth of air. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Even as a fig tree casted her untimely figs. When she is shaking of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. When it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man that means virtually everyone rich and poor high and lowly educated and illiterate in the city and in the village rural people and city people it says they hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The Lord has given us the warning today. From the mouth of Joel, through the prophecy of Joel, he has told us that 
a time of indignation and wrath and devastation is coming. And then he's telling us, if we do not escape today, if we do not run away today and run to hide in the refuge of Christ today, how shall we escape if that day will come upon us just a few years ago in America? It was discovered there was going to be an earthquake. The scientists with all their instruments, all their gadgets, they discovered at a partic in a particular area that this earthquake will come with volcano and everything it will erupt. Liquid fire will come. And they, they said it over the radio, they said it over the television, they published it in the papers. Everybody started moving. Everybody started gathering whatever they could gather. Here was a man. He had established there. And he had built a magnificent house there. And all his property, everything he had, it was there. And then uh, as, uh, the, as the radio announcement was coming, everybody rushing, everybody moving, this man, he had a sieve, he didn't hear anything. And it remained himself alone in his mansion. It remained himself alone with all his property, vehicle there, everything there. And people even went to him. And they told him, everybody has moved. Everybody is gone. How about you? He said, don't you worry. How oh, can I build all these things here? Have all these things in place? This is my very life. Uh, my mind doesn't believe all that announcement. Nothing will happen. And so he stayed there. Hours to the time, because uh, the, the scientists, they measure the time. They said, it's coming, it's coming. And everybody, everybody, they were pitching this man. And when they spoke and spoke and spoke, he will not bulge, he will not move. He remained there. And at the right hour, according to the announcement over the radio, television, and newspapers, the eruption, the volcano, the earthquake struck, house, car, man, Everything went out with the liquid of fire. That man died. He died in his foolishness. Here you are today. I've told you something. Older than any scientist. Older than any gadget of science. Almighty God, the creator, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He sent his prophet. And he told the people. And he's telling us today. A day is coming. When this whole earth will burn up in fire. It will be more than a local hurricane, earthquake, tornado, or, vol or volcano. It's going to erupt everywhere. And everything you have amassed, everything will go up in flames. But before that day, there's going to be the sound of the trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive, alive in Christ, we shall be raised incorruptible. And then shall we be caught up to be with our Lord. You will be there. You will be there. And then you will escape. But for the people that will do like that man, foolish man, he heard, he acted as if he didn't hear. He said, my house is there, my car is there, everything is there. And then the eruption came, the volcano came, himself, his car, his property, everything in a moment of time. Wait, how then shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which shall, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. You came today, so you will hear the word of God. And the Lord sent me to you to read and study with you the book of prophet Joel. So you will escape. You will escape in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord, you are going to escape the coming judgment. You are not for judgment. You are for mercy. You are for mercy. You are for salvation. You are for deliverance. You are not for judgment. The Lord loves you. That's why he's sending the warning. He sent the warning to the people in Noah's day. Many of them did not accept. They did not repent. You will not be like them. Prepare, prepare, prepare to meet the Lord your God.